Dr. Kevin Porteous is Assistant Professor of Politics at Hillsdale College and Faculty Advisor for the Washington Hillsdale Internship Program. He earned his BA at Ashland University and his MA and PhD in Politics from the Institute of Philosophic Studies at the University of Dallas. Previously, he taught at Belmont Abbey College near Charlotte, North Carolina and Mountain View College in Dallas, Texas. Recently, he completed a book manuscript, Executive Details, Public Administration and American Constitutionalism, publication of which is forthcoming. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kevin Porteous. I'm under orders. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, I'd like to thank the, the Kirby Center and Dr. Bob, its director, and Hillsdale College for giving me the opportunity to come and speak to you today about uh, the question, is there a place for regulatory agencies in the Constitution? And I suppose that's something of a leading question. Uh, we have at least some idea of where, uh, you should have at least some idea of where I'm going to be going with this today. Uh, and it's not any surprise to anyone who's familiar uh, with the work of the college and our understanding of the Constitution and the American founding that modern regulatory agencies uh, occupy a very tenuous place within the American political order. And I'd like to uh, support that assertion by referring to three specific uh, constitutional issues. The, uh, the first of which is the broad doctrine of the separation of powers about which Senator Lee spoke uh, in his talk. Second is the non-delegation doctrine, the idea that legislative power belongs to the legislature, again, we're going to do some expansion and, and, and talking about that. And then finally, the executive's power of removal, which is something that's not particularly well understood, but proves to be vital to maintaining the separation of power structure uh, of the American Constitution with regards to administration. Now, first with the separation of powers. The separation of powers is the central structural feature of the Constitution. Federalism is there, the idea of a large republic is there, the idea of limited government, those are all there. But when one looks at the Constitution itself, the text itself is organized around the idea that, that different powers and different branches belong in different places and that they should be separated from one another. And the first purpose of this, obviously, is to prevent tyranny by preventing the accumulation of power in a single set of hands. And Madison is very clear about this in Federalist 47, that the accumulation of power in one set of hands, no matter what set of hands it might be, is by definition tyrannical. And so later on in Federalist 51, he tells us that human nature is enlisted to keep the branches in line. He says, quote, the constant aim is to divide and arrange the several offices in such manner as that each may be a check on the other, that the private interest of every individual may be a sentinel over the public rights. We are using the human nature of office holders who want to maintain their power and who want to maintain their position in order to maintain the overall efficacy of the whole structure. Okay? And this is absolutely true and it's vital, but I would suggest to you that there is a second purpose to the separation of powers, one that is often overlooked and I think imperfectly understood, but is at least as important as the function of preventing tyranny. And that's the role that the separation of powers plays in promoting good or promoting effective government. Right? We don't typically think of the constitutional order as being meant to facilitate the effective operation of the government. Right? We tend to think of the Constitution and the separation of power system as throwing up roadblocks. And in some ways it does. Right? But in other ways, it is acutely conscious of the fact that it's essential if you are going to have practical liberty, if liberty is actually going to exist, that you not just organize a good Constitution and have good laws, but that those laws be effectively and, ju and justly implemented. Right? It does no good, for example, 
to hire a very excellent architect to design a wonderful building, such as the building we're all standing in today, and then hire the Three Stooges to build it. All right, what you get is the Three Stooges beat each other with two by fours for six months, and then you have nothing. The plan was fantastic, but the implementation was poor. Right? And if the implementation is poor, then the plan, for all practical purposes, is irrelevant. So the thing has to function effectively as well. And they were conscious of this. In Federalist 48, Madison makes the point that power, rather than being a single mass for the Founding Fathers, was partitioned into powers in the plural. He said, uh, after discriminating, therefore, in theory, the several classes of power as they may be in their nature, legislative, executive, or judiciary, unquote, then and only then can we go on to talk about organizing the branches themselves. So that the first and most important task of setting up a constitutional order is figuring out what the powers are. And Madison's statement, I think, very clearly states that there is something substantively different about legislative power that separates it from executive power. They're not the same thing. And so what it takes to execute effectively is fundamentally different from what it takes to legislate effectively. And so we need separate and distinct institutions in order to do that. Alexander Hamilton points out in Federalist 70, for example, that unity in the executive is as essential as multiplicity in the legislature. For in the, in the executive, in the president, we want decisive, swift action. Whereas when laws are being made and our rights and duties under the law are being decided, we want different interests and different ideas to be heard. We want that body to deliberate, to think, to act slowly. And so it becomes apparent fairly quickly right, that no one institution can do both of those things well, simply as a matter of physical reality. If you are a unitary body, you cannot at the same time be a body composed of multiple members. Right? And so if you are constructed to legislate effectively, then by definition, you are not an institution that can execute effectively. Nevertheless, if one examines modern administrative agencies, one notices very quickly that it is precisely to do all of these things at once that modern administrative agencies attempt. So let me, let me give you an example, right? and this is, this is taken from uh, uh, a very prominent Harvard Law article 20 years ago uh, he's called The Rise and Rise of the Administrative State. Right? He says, the author Gary Lawson says, consider the typical uh, enforcement activities of a typical federal agency. So for example, the Federal Trade Commission. The commission promulgates substantive rules of conduct. The commission then considers whether to authorize investigations into whether the commission's rules have been violated. If the commission authorizes an investigation, the investigation is conducted by the commission which reports its findings to the commission. If the commission thinks that the commission's findings warrant an, an enforcement action, the commission issues a complaint. The commission's complaint that a, com that a commission rule has been violated is then prosecuted by the commission and adjudicated by the commission. This commission adjudication can take place either before the full commission or before a semi-autonomous administrative law judge who is an employee of the commission. If the commission chooses to adjudicate before an administrative law judge rather than before the commission and the decision is adverse to the commission, the commission can then appeal to the commission. If the commission ultimately finds a violation, then and only then the affected private party can appeal to an Article III court. But the agency decision, even before a bona fide Article III tri tribunal, possesses a very strong presumption of correctness on matters both of fact and of law. Right? And so we laugh about this, right? But the laughter, I think, only masks right, the scale of the constitutional problem here, right? which is simply Right? The assumption that we can create an institution right, that is different from all of the institutions that are set up by the Constitution and that, that it somehow can perform not just one function right, of the federal government but all of them 
simultaneously and do it more effectively and more justly than the separated system, which recognizes the substantive difference between the powers. And I'd like, what I'd like to do next then is to take a brief look at two examples of how separation of powers works as it relates to administrative agencies. And the first of these, uh, as I noted at the outset, was the non-delegation doctrine. Now, the first substantive clause of the Constitution says that all legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which shall consist of a Senate and of a House of Representatives. And this is what's referred to as the legislative vesting clause. And the implications right, of that statement are fairly simple. If the power is legislative and it is constitutional, that is to say, later on, this is the herein granted part, the Constitution enumerates a list of things that the federal legislature can do. Right? It can't do anything that might be legislative. It can do those things that are legislative that are listed later on in the Constitution. Right? So if it is a legislative power and it is constitutional, then it must be exercised by Congress. Okay. So the political philosopher John Locke notes that Congress cannot transfer this power. And he says, quote, the legislative cannot transfer the power of making laws to any other hands. For it being but a delegated power from the people, they who have it cannot pass it over to others. Okay only the people can decide where to place the legislative power. And in the Constitution, they have placed that power in Congress. Okay. Uh, Justice Scalia, in, in one of his more biting dissents, notes that when Congress transfers its power to other entities, it has the effect of creating what he, what he calls, quote, junior varsity legislatures. Okay. We have a problem. It's complicated. It's politically divisive. So we create an institution and let them legislate on that particular area. Right? And we have hundreds of these floating around Washington, DC. Right? Okay, so Congress can't transfer this power. No power is granted to Congress to create additional legislative entities. Congress must exercise this power for, its, for itself. But that then gives rise to the question, what is the legislative power? Right? And my students are very quick with the answer, it's the power to make laws. And then I'm very quick with the counter question, all right, what's a law? And then silence. Right? And that's a little more difficult. The founders had something to say about this. Right? Alexander Hamilton in Federalist 75 notes that the legislative power is the power to prescribe rules for the regulation of society. Uh, Hamilton, or excuse me, James Madison in his essay, Vices of the Political System of the United States, says that the legislative power is the power to mark with precision the duties of those who are to obey them and to take from those who are to administer them a discretion which might be abused. Okay? So if we can translate those statements, and there are many others like them, right? I'll give you one more. Madison in Federalist 62 says that law is defined to be a rule of action. But how can that be a rule which is little known and less fixed? And to reinforce the idea of little known, a depressing fact that I like to share with my students, is that there's a, there's a book, a publication of the federal government called the Federal Register. Right? And this is the journal of all the new and proposed regulations that the federal government, the federal agencies, this is not Congress, mind you, comes up with in a given calendar year. And it starts every January 1st, a new volume starts at page one. Okay? And in a given year, uh, by December 31st, federal government is somewhere in the range of 70 to 80,000 pages. Right? And this is in addition to all of the previous still existing regulations right, and the United States Code, which is the law enacted by Congress. Right? And if you ever have a chance to look at the Federal Register, it's in that wonderful government print too. It's like reading your tax return for 80,000 pages, right? at any rate. All right, so how do we translate these assertions about the meaning of law? Right? Law, I think, must make substantive policy choices. That is to say, it must reflect the legislature's judgment 
concerning what ought to be the rights and duties of citizens. And in that vein, right, it must clearly delineate those rights and those duties. It must tell people what is permitted under the law, what is required under the law, and what is prohibited under the law in such a way that you and I, as well-informed citizens, can read the law and understand it and understand what, our, what are our rights and duties under the law. That is to say, law must be sufficiently clear that its commands are plainly discernible right, to citizens. Now, I would suggest, by the way, that uh, if you take a, take a quick look at federal laws, right, take, for example, the 2,500-page health care reform bill. Right? That's literally, I like to point out to my students, five reams of paper right, in that wonderful government language. And we, we, certain parts of it draw a great deal of criticism. For example, the individual mandate. We all know about the individual mandate, the idea that the government is going to compel us to uh, purchase health insurance and purchase health insurance of a certain quality right, or a certain kind. And it, that's something that's before the Supreme Court right now. And it has clear constitutional issues. Right? But one of the things that becomes apparent when you start reading the law is that for the most part it doesn't tell you anything. Right? It simply says this agency or this official will make this rule right? and it leaves it to someone else right? rather than making the decision for itself. Right? So for example, just recently the Department of Health and Human Services has decreed that religious employers must cover contraception at no cost for their employees as part of their employee health plan. This has been the subject of at least a couple of lawsuits, uh, in, mostly involving uh, religiously based colleges and universities, one of which is my former employer. Uh, the individual mandate is problematic. But the real long-term nightmare of the health care law from a constitutional perspective Right? is the fact that these kind of policy decisions are made by people other than the United States Congress, right? other than legislatures who are specifically elected to do that specific job. Right? And that's the kind of thing, right? those kinds of orders from federal agencies, from cabinet officials, those are the kind of things that are really rules for the regulation of society. Right. In broad terms, the health care law mostly says, we want everyone to have quality, affordable health care. Now, you cabinet officials and you at agencies that we're creating or empowering, you tell us what we have to do in order to achieve that. Right. And you make the rules for the regulation of society. Right. The things that actually affect people's rights and duties. Right. The things that tell people, this is permitted, this is required, this is prohibited. Right. If an agency or an executive branch official is doing that, then whatever we call it, then they are legislating. They are exercising the legislative power. Let me give you one more example. In the previous Congress, the first Congress under the Obama administration, the health care law was enacted. But the environmental regulation or environmental proposal, commonly known as cap and trade, died. It passed through the House, but was unable to clear the Senate for a variety of reasons. Right? Mostly agricultural and coal state senators were not interested in committing political suicide, right? even Democratic ones. Right? Uh, after the election in 2010, right? President Obama said something to the effect of, well, there's more than one way to skin that cat. We're looking into other options. Right? And he used that language. Right, during, I think it was a press conference. And what he meant by that was, we weren't able to get this done through the legislative process, so we're going to do it through the regulatory process. And that's exactly what we're doing. Right? The Environmental Protection Agency is implementing, if not the exact features of cap and trade, then its substantive provisions, that is to say, the substantive impact that it will have on American business, on American economy, on American workers, through the regulatory process. And this Congress, and many of the people who voted for them, are coming to the stunning realization that when you have delegation, the reality is elections don't matter. It doesn't matter 
that 63 Democratic members of the House of Representatives disappeared in the election of 2010 and were replaced by Republicans, right, net. Right? It doesn't matter, right, that voters sent an apparently unambiguous message, right, that's all irrelevant, right, because it can all be done through the regulatory process in substance, if not in exact form. So we're getting a series of new federal regulations on a variety of things. Carbon emissions, mercury is the new one that's coming out this week. Right. Um, I suppose I should note the obvious irony of the Environmental Protection Agency uh, imposing new, new caps on mercury when at the same time the federal government is compelling all of us to introduce mercury gas into our own homes. Right. Uh, through the recently, uh, not recently enacted, but a, a uh, a requirement that recently took effect uh, in light bulb emissions that is essentially going to mandate fl compact fluorescent light bulbs, which do contain mercury gas. At any rate, right, in these cases and every other, entities other than Congress are exercising legislative authority, and in every single instance, it is with the permission of Congress. Right? Congress passed the laws that transferred this authority. And so in a way, I, don't, I think this is heresy to say this, but in a way I almost feel sorry for regulators at times because they do have a difficult task. They have to make these political hot button decisions without the support of anything like an election to back them up. Right? A congressman can at least say, my constituents want X. And if he's right, he'll get reelected, and if he's wrong, he won't. Right? Regulators can't do that. Right? The real root problem is with Congress. Right? Congress enacted these laws and could unenact them at any time. Right? Now, this is not to say right, that delegation does not have the blessing of the other institutions of government. For example, 20 years ago, the Supreme Court asserted that our jurisprudence has been driven by a practical understanding that in our increasingly complex society, replete with ever-changing and more technical problems, Congress simply cannot do its job absent an ability to delegate power under broad general directives. Right? The world is too hard now for citizen legislators. Right? Even ones who are intelligent, patriotic, and committed to the Constitution. Right? And again, so long as Congress delineates an intelligible principle, then it can delegate, right? And by intelligible principle, they mean something to the effect of, we can understand what they're trying to do when it comes up for judicial review, right? Now, what are some examples right, of intelligible principles that have passed constitutional muster? The law that created the Federal Communications Commission states that the Federal Communications uh, commission is to regulate broadcast licensing, quote, as public interest, convenience, or necessity require, unquote. Right? Which in effect means anything the agency thinks is relevant. Right? The Americans with Disabilities Act mandates that employers and educators must make, quote, reasonable accommodations. Well, what constitutes a reasonable accommodation? Typically one doesn't know until one is told by a judge, right, which is after the fact and that employers and educators cannot impose an undue hardship. Again, what does that mean? Well, the regulators and, and the judges are going to tell us eventually. Right? Back to the health care law. The Secretary of Health and Human Services, and I know this hasn't passed constitutional muster, but it's, it's a wonderful example. The Secretary of Health and Human Services can determine what constitute essential health benefits that must be offered by employers as part of their health coverage. Right? Now, shouldn't what constitutes, assuming of course that Congress can enact health care legislation of this kind in the first place, right, doesn't it seem as though essential would be a determination that a legislature should make? Right? And that in making that determination, in reaching those conclusions, one is going to decide rules for the regulation of society. All right. so, if one compares the constitutional order and the modern regulatory state, one sees many advantages in the former. Right? Congress was specially designed to legislate effectively. An agency, however it's constituted, can only be a poor shadow in terms of the, the structural quality of the institution. Right? 
very quick way of understanding that is your legislature is elected every two years or six years. Right? But nobody votes for an agency. And that electoral process, specifically designed in the Constitution, was meant to contribute to the quality of deliberation. All right. Legislators, secondly, must consider the general interest because they are elected by their districts or their states as a whole, and not simply by one particular interest group within that district or state. Whereas agencies right, are disproportionately influenced by the various interests which they regulate. Why? Well, but that, that's simple. Because the regulators are concentrated right here in Washington, and it's an easy thing for a lobbyist, an, interest, uh, an industry, or a public interest group right, to send its people over here to influence regulators. Right? A congressman has to look at an environmental interest group and say, yes, I understand your concerns, but I also have this other issue to deal with, which is the people in my district need to work. Right? And so I have to think about both of those things. A regulator does not, and in many cases, is statutorily prohibited from taking those other factors into account. Right? When Congress does the legislating, there are limits to the quantity of legislation that gets passed. Right? One legislature can only do so much as a matter of physical reality. Right? On the other hand, when you can simply create more legislatures, you can simply create more opportunity to make laws. And so you have 80,000 pages a year of new regulations in addition to all pre-existing laws. Right? It curtails the problem of vague or contradictory legislation. Right? Congress is as capable of being contradictory as anybody else. But when you have hundreds of legislatures, the possibility of being told to do two different and incompatible things at the same time is lessened. So the light bulb example, you're less likely to have that problem if you have one group of people making the laws. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, there is a union of power and responsibility. The people who exercise the legislative power are held accountable for it. Under the modern system, Congress takes credit for the benefits it creates. We gave you clean air. We gave you quality, affordable health care. While passing responsibility for the costs it imposes off onto, in many cases, hapless regulators whom congressmen then turn around and condemn. Right? The same congressman who voted to give that power to the agency in the first place. Right? It's very convenient for the Congress. Okay. So that much by way of problems of delegation and the legislative power. The final topic I'd like to talk to you a little bit about today is the executive removal power. Right? the power that the president has under the Constitution to fire those who work in the executive branch. And this is a difficult one, I think especially uh, for people who are interested in the Constitution and limited government, because the removal power, the power to fire, is not explicitly delineated in the Constitution. The appointment power is. Article 2, Section 2 of the Constitution very plainly states the modes by which executive officers under the president can be hired. However, the removal power is left somewhat to inference. So the Constitution is silent on the removal power, but it creates a unitary executive branch. So the executive vesting clause, the president's counterpart to the legislative vesting clause states, the executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States of America. Two important considerations here. President of the United States of America, one person. Secondly, the executive power as opposed to all legislative power herein granted. Right? In other words, we're not going to give you a list of the things that the executive can do that's exhaustive. We're going to tell you that the executive power as a body with certain exceptions and qualifications that are stated in the Constitution is granted to the president and consistent with the overall systems of separation of powers, individual liberty, and so on. This includes, I believe, the power to fire those who work under the president. And Madison tells the first Congress who had to decide this issue in, in creating the cabinet, quote, I conceive that if any power whatsoever is in its nature executive, 
It is the power of appointing, overseeing, and controlling those who execute the laws. Right? Unlike Congress, which can do the legislating for itself, the nature of executive power is such that the president can't do it all himself. He can't be sitting at the dock at the Port of New York waiting for the ships to come in to collect the customs duties and right, be off in Arizona prosecuting a tax violation. He can't do it all at once. He needs extra pairs of eyes and extra pairs of hands. And that's the way right, that the founders referred to people who worked under the president. They were his eyes and his hands. Right? Hamilton in Federalist 72 calls them deputies or assistants of the chief magistrate. Okay. So the problem is, right, if the president can't control the people who are exercising executive power, how can he ha be held responsible for it? How can we say that the president has the executive power if he has no control over those whose hands and eyes are actually on the scene exercising executive power? Right? Another member of Congress, Benjamin Goodhue, said, it was the peculiar duty of the president to watch over executive officers. But of what avail would be his inspection unless he had a power to correct the abuses he might discover? And the ultimate check on the power of those subordinate administrators is the power that the president possessed to fire them and then to hire somebody right, through the appointment process who would do things the way the president wanted them done. And not only is this vital for maintaining the form of the Constitution, maintaining the way the Constitution understands, well, the president should have this power, but it's absolutely vital to maintaining the connection between executive power and the people. Right? It's not just the lawmaking power that is meant to be popular. All power under the Constitution is meant to be ultimately controlled by the people, either directly or indirectly. So another interesting quote from Madison at about the same time, he says, if the president should possess alone the power of removal from office, those who are employed in the execution of the law will be in their proper situation. And the chain of dependence be preserved. The lowest officers, the middle grade, and the highest will depend, as they ought, on the president, and the president on the community. The chain of dependence therefore terminates in the supreme body, namely in the people. We choose a president, or at least it was originally understood that we should choose a president, with the idea that he would be the chief executive because we wanted that person to be in charge of the execution of the laws. Right? And what that means in practice is that we want him to put people in place who will execute the law the way that we wanted it executed. And then if we don't like the way he's executed, it's, it is executed, excuse me, we can replace them by replacing the president. So that ultimately, however indirect the process may be, the people still control the executive power, just like they control the legislative power. Now, I would argue that the modern regulatory agency very distinctly severs this link in two different ways. Right? You have regulatory commissions like the Federal Communications Commission or the Federal Election Commission. Right? And the commissioners on those agencies serve fixed terms. And they can only be removed for cause. That is to say, political disagreement about how to execute the law with the elected president cannot be used as a basis for removing one of these commissioners. Right? Secondly, most federal employees, right? and most federal employees are in the executive branch, right? technically. Most federal employees are covered over by civil service protection. It's a wonderful old cartoon that I like to share with my students from the New Yorker, and it shows two bureaucrats sitting at their desks next to each other. And there's a window between them, and in the background you can see the White House. Right? And one of them looks at the other and says, just think about it, Ed. Presidents come and go but we're forever, right? And that's the reality of the civil service, right? Most of the people who exercise executive power in the details on a day-to-day -day basis are insulated and consciously so from political control. So that, again, just like with non-delegation, 
elections don't matter. We elect a new president, and in many ways, the agencies just keep humming along as though nothing ever happened because it's the same personnel, right? The same people. And even if a president nominates and sends over to an agency a director, a commissioner, a uh, cabinet secretary, or so on, right, it's extremely difficult for that person to get control of that agency. And in many cases, as Nixon liked to complain, the new director himself would go native. That is to say, end up siding with the agency he'd been sent to rein in, okay? which is extremely problematic from the perspective of a constitution which is meant to preserve representative government, right? Effective control by the people over all of the functions of government, okay? This arrangement, the commissioner structure in particular, was ratified by the Supreme Court many years ago. A very famous case called uh, Humphrey's Executor versus United States. The court says, the commission is to be nonpartisan, and the commission in question here is the Federal Trade Commission, the aforementioned Federal Trade Commission, and it must, from the nature of its very nature of its duties, act with entire impartiality. It is charged with the enforcement of no policy except the policy of the law. Now, I would be very grateful if someone would explain to me how that's not executive power. The policy that they enforce is the policy of the law. And that sounds like the enforcement power of the executive to me, but somehow, and with no explanation, that's different, according to the court here. Like the Interstate Commerce Commission, its members are called upon to exercise the trained judgment of a body of experts appointed by law and informed by experience. In other words, what we here today consider a bug of the system of having independent commissioners, the court at this time, and as uh, my colleague, Dr. Pastrudo, will discuss in his, in his uh, talk afterwards, I believe. Uh, this was a feature of the system, right? this independence. Right? We want to harness this expertise uncorrupted by politics. And you can see examples of the problem in action. Think about the multitudinous security leaks within the Bush administration. Right? It seemed like every week or every month, some new bit of information that wasn't supposed to be public comes oozing out of an administrative agency, usually related to the intelligence and defense fields. Well, what happened? Okay. Well, you've got a bunch of people in there who are holdovers from previous administrations who are philosophically and ideologically opposed to the new administration, and so they're going to do what they can in their position to sabotage their opponent. Now, if the president could come in and clean house, you'd have something of a different story. So what are the consequences, practical consequences, of the evisceration of the executive removal power? You have the creation of what, what is referred to repeatedly of a headless fourth branch. Right? There's, a, there's a struggle right, uh, within, the, within the government for control of these agencies. You have an entirely new entity, and the elected branches fight over it. Right? The Congress wants control, the president wants control, right? and the consequence is not only do laws get made worse or in an inferior manner than they were under the Constitution, but they get implemented more ineffectively as well. The other problem is the same problem you have with delegation, which is to say el eliminating the executive removal power severs the link between the power of an individual and his responsibility to the people. Congress, which now ultimately controls the administration, in the absence of an effective removal power, escapes blame. Right? Congress uses its budgetary power now to control agencies. Right? Administrators themselves are insulated from public control and the president who gets the blame, or at least a large portion of the blame, can do nothing about it. Right? So what I've tried to do then is to delineate some specifics Right, looking to the actual text of the Constitution and working through some of its implications of how it is that the administrative state is constitutionally problematic. Right? Modern regulatory agency, agencies, I would conclude, are incompatible with both the text and theory of the Constitution and therefore have no place in the political system created by the Constitution. I thank you all very much for listening.
we have our first question, please. My name is Jay Zawatsky. I come from Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, you have well described the problems uh, and why essentially these uh, administrative agencies are unconstitutional. But what is the answer? Is it just simply to zero out their budgets? You want solutions. I'm a problems man. <laughs> right? No. Um, that's a, the, the, obviously that's the challenging uh, next step is how do we how do we deal with this problem, and I can tell you at the very least some ways we can't deal with it. Right? Uh, one uh, one person who's written on this issue in great detail, uh, former uh, Nation, Natural Resources Defense Council attorney named D David Schoenbrod, who turned on the administrative state later on realized its problems. Uh, he said he, his proposal was let's do it through the judiciary. Right? The courts need to come in and enforce these doctrines. And one of the things that we've learned, and if you think about the court cases that I've cited in the course of my talk, is the judiciary is basically checked out on these issues. They're not interested. Uh, the case dealing with delegation where they signed off on it 20 years ago, they revisited it 10 years ago. Right? And in the words of another administrative law scholar, that new decision in 2001, which is the, the Whitman trucking case, can basically be boiled down to four words. Go away. See Mistretta. Mistretta versus the United States was the previous case in 1989. Right? That's it. Right? So the courts aren't going to be aren't going to solve it. Right? Another lesson that we learned from the Reagan administration is that the president can't solve it, even if he wants to. Right? He simply doesn't have the capacity. Right? Reagan tried right, to rein in administrative agencies, and he had some success in slowing down the growth of the regulatory state, but not in halting it or reversing it altogether. Right? And once he was out of office, he didn't leave any lasting effects. That is to say, the pace of regulation picked right up again to pre-Reagan levels after the Reagan administration. Right? The president does not possess the tools to get effective control of, of the administrative state. Right? And so that leaves us with Congress. Right? Congress created the thing. Right? The thing. It happened over many decades and took many hundreds of laws. But, but Congress created modern regulatory agencies, all of them. Right? Congress could uncreate them by the time I sit down, if they so chose. Right? But they choose not to do it. Right? And I think there's a number of reasons for that, right? not the least of which is the one that I hinted at in my talk, which was that the self-interest of congressmen is served by the existing system. They get to take credit for the benefits right? and build credit with their voters for all the good things they do for them. We, look what I gave you. Right? And then some bureaucrat gets blamed for all the rules that have to be put in place that stifle economic growth and infringe on people's rights that are necessary to provide the good thing. Right? Okay. Yes, I gave you this much cleaner air at the cost, of, but he never says, you know, at the cost of 10,000 jobs in my district. Right? So he gets to push that off on the administrator. Well, the administrator made the rule. He did that. Right? And not only that, Right? But when Congress creates all these agencies that then turn around and create all these rules, it creates a massive minefield for citizens to wade through. And guess what? People get stuck in it. And when you get stuck in the regulatory minefield, who do you call for help? You call your congressman. I just got a mailer from my congressman. Right? Goings on in the 7th District of Michigan. Summary of, summary of events. Right? Things that I've done in Congress. It's a campaign document that you paid for. Right? It's all for me postage paid by the, by the taxpayers and so on. But on the back of it, it has this interesting little statement. And maybe you've seen this on something you've gotten. Need help with a federal agency? Are you having problem with your benefits? Are you having problem with a regulation? Are you not getting your social security check? Call me. I can help. Right? And congressmen have that power. In many cases, your congressman can help. Right? He can get you satisfaction. Right? My old department chairman was taking a group of, of students to uh, Latvia, Estonia, excuse me, and two days before he was set to leave, no passport, which he'd applied for six or seven months earlier. Called his congress, this is what's going on. He had the passport the next day. Right? When a congressman's office calls a federal agency, the agency has an incentive to listen. And the incentive is very simple. Right? Congressmen control the budgets and money makes the world go round in politics, in regulatory politics, right? So that, uh, 
when, when the congressman calls and says, hey, can you help, my, help out my constituent? It's a very tiny price to pay for the goodwill that it's going to build when it comes time to generate the next budget. Right? So it has to be in Congress that we find the solution. But Congress has all kinds of incentives not to fix the problem. Right? Uh, did most of today's congressmen create the problem? No, it's been building for many decades. But do they have any incentive to fix it? Also no. Right? And in fact, they have the perverse counter incentive to expand it. Right? Because the more agencies cre they create, the more problems people get into, the more help they need from their congressmen, and what, is that, what does the congressman get from his, from his citizens as a result? He gets electoral support. Right? Word of mouth is still the most powerful way that legislators build support. You should vote for this guy, one person says to another around the dinner table, he helped me out. Right? He took care of me when I needed something. Right? So again, this is, a, this is a dilemma, right? It should be in Congress that we find the solution, or it has to be in Congress that we find the solution, but Congress has also these, this perverse set of incentives that makes them not want to solve the problem, and in many cases to add to the problem. Does that make sense? That's the best answer I have, actually, at this point. But I have a question from one of our online viewers. This is Mike from Amherst, Ohio. He says, I have a very simple question. How do we as citizens effectively challenge bureaucratic violations of the Constitution? It's like solutions again. Anyway, yeah. No, this is, this is a distinct problem. Right? Because again, the courts have checked out on this issue. Not only have they signed off on these various constitutional violations, right, but modern judicial doctrine states that an administrative agency has a strong presumption of being right when challenged by a citizen or private group or anything of that kind. Right? In other words, the innocent until proven guilty doctrine when it comes to federal regulatory agencies is turned literally on its head. The presumption is the agency is right and you are wrong. Generally, that means you're guilty until you figure out some way to prove that you're not guilty of the violation in question right? because of that presumption of, of rectitude. Um, I don't know. I, I, it's a depressing topic. Uh, it, it really is. You should see the look on my students' faces when I, when I just finally come to the point and say, elections don't matter, and here's why. Right? And it just really takes the wind out of their sails, right? Because Hillsdale students, right, whatever their, whatever their background or their major, right, they have an interest in the Constitution, they like self-government, they like liberty, and then to hear that is, is just deflating. But in many ways, it's true. Right? That um, unless you get people, particularly in the Congress, right, who recognize this problem and who are literally, and this is a really hard thing to do, literally willing to act in a way counter to their own immediate electoral self-interest, right? then it's not going to change. Right? And you're not going to have effective recourse. One of the most effective ways to deal with the worst violations right, uh, of, uh, made by the federal government today is not through the law, but through a public relations campaign. Right? Uh, after the uh, Kelo case was passed, having to do with the takings clause and eminent domain, the uh, city of Long Beach, California, went after the Filipino Bible Fellowship, which was an immigrant church that met in a double-wide trailer. Right? Most of them didn't speak any English. And so here comes the city with its lawyers and says, here, we're going we're gonna to take your land and demolish your church so we can build a, I think it was condominiums, what, a shopping mall or something. It doesn't really matter. Uh, they didn't win in the courts. They won because they got some pro bono legal help that consisted of a group of attorneys who went out and humiliated the city to the point, embarrassed them, look what you're doing to these people, to the point where they backed down. Had nothing to do with whether the fact that, right, by any rational standard, the Filipino Bible Fellowship was in the right and had everything to do with they had friends who could make life miserable for the city. Right? Uh, and so, really, you know, in many cases, it boils down to, do you have influence? If you have influence, you can generally avoid the worst effects of, of, these, uh, of these regulations. If you don't, well, that's very difficult for you then. <laughs>
Yes, ma'am. My name's Georgianne Gautridge, and I'm from Fairfax, Virginia. In your presentation, of course, you did note the massive amounts of uh, regulations that are now in effect, but you really didn't discuss the fact that under the Administrative Procedure Act, an agency must go through the rulemaking process, and that rulemaking process invites public participation. Does that in any way affect your conclusions about um, the um, overarching authority of, uh, and I guess, unaccountability of federal, regu right. fe federal regulators? Right, yes, the, 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 the comment system, right? Most federal regulations are made under a process from the Administrative Procedure Act known as informal rulemaking. And this is also referred to as notice and comment rulemaking. Right. The agency is required to post notice in the Federal Register that it intends to regulate X. Right. It's then required to leave a certain amount of time open for public comment or to allow public comment at a hearing or something of that sort. Right. And, but the problem is, and the reason that it doesn't ultimately affect uh, the outcome, or doesn't necessarily have to affect the outcome, is because what the regulators choose to do with that comment is entirely up to them. Right. In other words, this is designed as a substitute for the public input that Congress gets through the electoral process, right? But the input that Congress gets through the electoral process is, well, backed up by elections, right? And the public input and the force of, of public comment right, that regulators get is not backed in this way, right? And so the regulators can choose to do anything they please with that information up to inclu and including ignoring it altogether. Right? Let me give you an example that's not regulatory state but, but shows you the bureaucratic mentality at work. When I was in graduate school I was teaching, adjunct teaching at a, at a community college and the schedule was set up so that you had classes, all classes were two day a week classes. So you had Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday and then a set of Friday, Saturday classes. And a new president came in, and he wanted to get rid of the Friday, Saturday classes and return to the standard Monday, Wednesday, Friday classes. Well, district policy and state law required that they conduct a survey of employees and students to gather information. This they did. The overwhelming majority of both employees and students said, let's keep the current system. Right? They switched to the other system. Right? That is to say, the whole idea of the comment period is something of a farce, right? It doesn't have to, right? They don't have to do anything with that information, right? Thank you very much, right in the circular file, right? We, we appreciate your input, see you later, right? They can take, they can use that information if they want, but there's no legal requirement that they have to uh, decide because they're the experts. They can decide, well, this piece of information is more important than that one. This piece is more true than that one. And who are we to question them? Right, in the case of the EPA, right, they're the climatologists, they're the chemists, they're the oceanographers and meteorologists and so on. What are we? Right? I haven't the vaguest idea how much benzene in the air is safe right, or sulfur dioxide. I don't know. Right? The dirty little secret, by the way, is neither do they. <laughs> right? There's gaps in the data that, right, that we just we don't know. Right? But the law is set up that they have to pretend to know. And essentially what that means in, purpose, in, in, in practice is that they simply impose their own policy judgments and then cover it over with, well, here's why the data supports us. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, my name is Linda Kendall, and I'm from Fairfax Station, Virginia. Um, I have a question um, that I think it's a little bit related. Um, it comes from a comment uh, in the State of the Union address um, that President Obama just gave. Um, which has me very concerned, and even more so after hearing you. Um, he uh, talked about um, going to Congress to ask authority to um, consolidate um, the bureaucracy under the executive. Um, what is your interpretation of that, and is there any risk or danger um, in terms of defining that quest as consolidation of power. Yeah, the, the way he described it, um, the way Obama described it is we're gonna make the federal government leaner and more efficient, right? Um, okay, <laughs> there's some chuckles in the audience and there's a good reason for that, right? Uh, this has been, right, this, this, this has been the, the shimmera that, that presidents and congresses have been chasing for decades, right? 
there have been reorganizations, right? There was one during the Clinton administration. Right? This goes back at least to the 1930s, right? With the Brownlow Commission, the President's Committee on Administrative Management, right? And the attempt to reorganize the federal government in order to make it more effective. Right? And the simple reality is that large government, by definition, is going to be ineffective. It doesn't matter how you shuffle the cards. Right? Uh, but you see, that, you see this in the corporate world as well. You get a new executive in, and he wants to change the organizational chart, right? rearranging the deck chairs, as it were. Right? And that often, right, in, I think in both the corporate and government world, serves as a substitute for actually making effective changes to the system. Well, if we only reorganize everything and change the flow chart, it'll all work just fine. Right? Now, the idea of consolidating executive power, right, and, and this does relate to my talk, is, is a good one, right? As long as what he's consolidating is executive power. Right? The problem is, is that he wants to con consolidate control of agencies that are also legislating and adjudicating at the same time. Right? That's the issue. Right? So one of these questions, one of these arguments that we get into is, which one do you do first? Right? Do, you restore power, do you restore executive power to the president, or do you disentangle the other functions from the agencies? And I have no idea how to answer that question. Right? Uh, but, yeah, the, 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 the government reorganization thing right, has been going on for many decades, and it really doesn't change very much. And, again, it's based on the false idea that if we only, again, change the flow chart, that everything will be efficient and effective. Right? And we've done this a number of times, and it never works. Right? Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. The egregious unconstitutional power grab of the federal agencies has been well laid out by you and Congress, or Senator Lee, but what about the states? Do the states also have their own problems in terms of their administrative agencies? And those are incubators for um, democracy. So is the best way to try to reform the states and start smaller and then build up to the federal level? Right. The states uh, certainly present more opportunities, I think, simply because you have more of them. Uh, but you're right. I mean, the states are the, the states have their problems as well. Uh, Hillsdale College students love federalism, and I love federalism. Federal, the, the partition of power between federal and state governments. But one of the things that we have to remember is that the states have dropped the ball a number of times. Right, the Constitution itself was formed in large reaction to the failure of the states to effectively protect the rights of their citizens. Right? Majorities in the states were using the state mechanisms of the state governments to expropriate other people within the state. Right? After the formation of the Constitution, right, and for many decades thereafter, uh, there, was this, there was this peculiar institution Right? The states were, meant, were, were originally intended, if you read Federalist 45, as the primary guarantors of individual rights and the primary makers of laws that affected individuals on a day-to-day -day basis. Right? But the states dropped the ball in the most egregious way possible because right, it's th under the auspices of the states that you have the institution of slavery. Right? So the states are not s simply saying, oh, well, the states. Right? That's not a magical solution that solves the problem either. Right? Because the state governments are just as susceptible to those forces uh, as any other level of government. Right? But, and you, but you can see right, that, that there are opportunities. Right? So you, you, you rein in the control of a special interest in states like Wisconsin and the failed attempt in Ohio and so on uh, to get control of their employees. Right? And so there, there are possibilities. Uh, in the states, but those also vary largely on a state-by-state -state basis. Some states are more amenable to change than others, right, to reform than others, right? Some of them, I would probably put California in this category, are nearly hopeless, right, uh, because of the, the way their system is structured, the, the, Cal the California government is structured. It makes it very difficult uh, to, uh, constitutionally speaking, get things back on track. This will be our final question. Uh, Jane from Exeter, New Hampshire asks, both parties love to expand federal power through administrative agencies. How can we rein in the bureaucracy when both parties are complicit in its expansion? 
That's another one of those sad truth statements I have to deliver to my students on a regular basis. Right? And that simply is, is this. It's, take a look around. Right? You're watching the Republican nomination take place. We know who the Democratic nominee is going to be. And I said, ask yourself the following question. Right? Which progressive do you want as your next president? Right? Newt Gingrich, Mitt Romney, or Barack Obama? And this, this happened before the, the uh, potential rise of, of Rick Santorum. But that's, that's the situation, right? And that's a very accurate description of the situation, right? The, um, the leadership in both parties is in many ways committed to the modern state, right? Now, right, does this suggest that a third party is what's necessary? No, not necessarily. That's, I'm not making that argument, right? But it does suggest to go back to sort of old 18th century uh, British understandings is that what you have in many respects is the court party and the country party, right? You have a governing class and you have everyone else, right? And many, not all, but many Republicans are part of the governing class, right? And this is the, right, this is the result of many decades of having a governing class and having, right, and, and, the, and the many decades of having this administrative state that, that creates this disconnect between the people and those who do the governing, right? So I haven't, I haven't the slightest idea how to, how to fix that, right? Um, stop voting for the people in the court party, I suppose. Uh, but that's a hard thing to tell people to do, right? Uh, particularly when it comes to Congress, right? People hate Congress but they love their congressman. And I think, by the way, that constituent services aspect is a huge part of that, right? Congress is a disaster, but my guy looks out for me. And so there's this cognitive dissonance in the people, right? Every, lots of people, right? The thing is an institu is an institution is, a dis is disastrous, right? 13% approval rating in one recent poll that I read for the United States Congress. And yet these Congress, right, the individual congressmen, and so it apparently never occurs to people when they go to the polls that, wait a minute, my congressman is part of this institution, right? Until you reestablish that connection, right, reform certainly at the legislative level is going to be enormously problematic, right? Getting people in. You saw some, you saw some glimmers of that. I think, you know, People like Senator Lee are certainly a step in the right direction. Right? But we need more of those people, and that demands, in the end, a more educated public. Right? In the end, it comes down to, right, in many respects, a civic education project. Right? If the people are going to rule, right, Washington says in his farewell address, if public opinion is going to govern, then public opinion has to be enlightened. Right? All right. I'd like to thank you all very much for your attendance and participation today.